Welcome to another edition of Street Talk with me, Noah Lee. This is podcast number seven, the show where we talk to content creators on YouTube. With me today is a guest from the USA. He is the host of the Hot Parking Podcast, and he has the most iconic Acura NSX on the planet. Without further ado, let me welcome Mr. Jay Fanning. Hey Jay, so welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation. So how are you today? I'm doing good, man. Things here in uh, Arizona, USA are, are really hot, over 100 degrees every day. But um, I'm doing good. I mean, how are you doing? Uh, I'm fine. Uh, things over here in Sinjin is uh, not too bad. Good. Well, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so Jay, um, why don't you tell the audience a little bit more about yourself, the man responsible for the Heart Parking Podcast. That's correct. Take it away, man. Yeah, so I have the Heart Parking Podcast. Uh, it's the non-automotive automotive podcast. And what that really means is we talk a lot about society and culture, and we still talk about cars, but not too much because to me, it's important the person who drives the vehicle you know, what are their thoughts on society? What are their thoughts on things that are going on? You know, whether it's cultural issues, I don't really talk politics, but I can in a certain way. And I just try to get people's perspective and their opinions just kind of step out of themselves. So if I have somebody who is famous on, I don't ask them about their movies. I ask them about their thoughts on X, Y, Z. Right. Interesting. So have you had anybody famous on your podcast? Yeah, I mean, no, you don't listen to my podcast? Yeah, sorry, man. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, you know, I, I guess the most famous recent person I had on there was Cody Walker, youngest okay. brother of Paul Walker. Mm, oh. um, I've had Joseph Gatt on there. I don't think people would know him as much by his name, but he's been in a lot of movies. He's been in, you know, Thor, Star Trek, um, Dumbo main character and one of the main characters in Dumbo. He has alopecia, so he has some hair loss, no eyebrows or anything. Mm. Uh, so we talked about his condition and just how how he's treated in society and how he's treated even in Hollywood, believe it or not. They still don't really look at him as a person. They kind of look at him as kind of an alien where he can only play like special characters because of the way he looks, which mm. is kind of, you know, um, I've had writer and producer of Noah R. Nelson, which is Craig T. Nelson's son. So most people know Craig T. Nelson by his name, but there used to be a show in the 90s called Coach, and he was the main character in the sitcom Coach. He also is the voice of Mr. Incredibles, uh, Mr. Incredible on the Incredibles animation, and he's been in a bunch of other movies. Um, I've had Noel G. on there. He He's known for playing Hector in the Fast and Furious movies, and he's been in a bunch of other movies. In fact, I'm working on editing that. I had that one. I did that one probably November, and the podcast came out, but I'm going to finally upload it to my YouTube page, which is Hard Parking Media slash Hard Parking Podcast. And I've had a bunch of other celebrities and just even local people, like non-famous people like myself, just to kind of get them on there because everybody has a – everyone has a voice. Everyone has an opinion. You don't have to be famous to talk about it exactly that's why i'm creating this uh, segment straight talk in my uh, channel to be able to reach out to many people content creators ordinary people who has an opinion who wants to share and uh, this is a platform that i have devised for us to have a talk well I'm, I'm happy to be here you know we've had kind of a connection for a couple of years and and anything you need me to be part of i can i'll try to be part of yeah really very grateful so um, what uh, cultural things did you guys talk about? It all depends. I mean, some of the big things that we face over here is student loans. You know, mm -hmm. our education system is a little different than other parts of the world. In some parts of the world, it's free. In some parts of the world, people don't even have a choice, right? And here we have a choice. And sometimes having a choice isn't always the best thing. I know that sounds terrible to say, but people get too relaxed and they lose focus. And so what happens is, coming out of high school, we don't really know what we want to do, most of us. And so we pick, okay, well, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to be an archeologist. I'm going to go dig up artifacts. And so you go to school for four years, you get your degree in archeology span or whatever it is, you can't find a job. So now you have 60,000, $100,000 in college debt 
and you can't find a job in your profession. So you just, you, so you start to pay back these student loans. And it's a really big problem over here, over like $1.3 trillion, I think. And so one of the big topics is student loan forgiveness. It's like from the president, if, if they're going to pass it, how much would it be? What would be the conditions? Are they going to wipe it all away? You know, are they going to wipe it moving forward? You know, and so that's, some of the discussions. So I had a good friend of mine on a car guy and I had another good friend of mine who doesn't care about cars. And that was one of the most downloaded episodes because it's, it was really about giving different perspectives coming from different backgrounds. Cause one friend said he's paid his off and his wife's everyone should have to pay. The other guy said, well, I think people should not have to pay everything, but we should be accountable for some things, but there's a lot of reasons why we haven't paid them all. And so I kind of moderated that and kind of went, you know, so that, those are some of the, the issues that we talk about, you know, um, as you guys know, the the Derek Chauvin case was global because of George Floyd. And I opened up and gave my opinion on the verdict, you know, mm-hmm. and that was a point of discussion. You know, the verdict had to be the way it was. That doesn't sound like the right thing to say, but consider the consequence of him being found not guilty. You know, the world burned last year. Can you imagine what would have happened this year? And he looked pretty guilty, but still we didn't know because a lot of Americans, a lot of people say, we saw it, we know what happened. But do you know what happened? Do you yeah. really know what happened? You have to wash away the emotion and look at it logically and just think about what you saw. Think about what the defense will be. Think about what the prosecution will be. And that's what it's about. It's not about whether you saw it or not. It's about can this group defend it well enough against this group accusing it? And that's all the court system is, at least over here. And those are kind of the things we talk about outside of cars and movies and stuff like that. Well, that's pretty in-depth. So, I mean, in your opinion, what do you think about the uh, student loans, uh, you know, scenario? Is that what what is your input on that? Well, I owe student loans. Um, I went to school a couple times. I got a degree the first time I went through for industrial design. And I thought about going to school for transportation design. I failed out of college. It just wasn't the right time for me. I just wasn't interested, to be honest. And I just worked small jobs for years. And then once I got married, I got back into school. I went full time, worked full time, got my degree, but I still had that debt. And then you get married, so you you inherit your spouse's debt. You know, you get a house, you get this, you get that. And my wife also has student loans, but hers are almost paid off. But I had a lot from before, and I still haven't paid them off. And with the interest rates, what happens is a certain point, and you've paid all this off, and then if you don't pay it off in time, then they dump on a bunch of interest on top. So then you go right back up here to the top, and so you keep paying. So. If I'm paying $600 a month, I would be paying for 40 years. Now, $600 a month is a lot for something that you're not really benefiting from. And so in one aspect, they're like, well, you picked your subject matter. You signed the dotted line. You're responsible. And I understand that. But a lot of people pick these these career paths and anything can happen. The path that I chose, I'm not doing biometric security, but it was a hot point at the time. And I didn't know going through school that in order to actually get a job, I either A, had to be ex-military or B, I had to be really good at coding. And I am terrible at coding. Terrible. So that means you have to be hired by a private contracting company and they don't want to hire you unless you know how to code. If you're a former military, the military and the government will hire you because I'm good at teaching. I'm good at talking. I'm good at communication. I can't write the code, but I can teach a code. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yep, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, sometimes as an artist, right, sometimes the best artists make the worst teachers. Sometimes the best athletes make the worst coaches. So it's not an exact science. Yeah. And, you know, my wife, she said, yeah, you can take this. And once you graduate, we'll go wherever we need to go. And, of course, once I graduated, she said, hell no, you're not going to the military. You go to the military, I divorce you. You know, so it's like, oh, you know. Um, And so I owe still. And, you know, if they took $10,000 off 
yeah, it'd be great. I mean, it isn't really going to make that big of a difference to me, but it can make a big difference to millions of Americans who are kind of trapped or feel like they're trapped because here's what happens. Every month, if you have your student loans, you have your house note, you have your car, you have your insurance, you have your groceries, you have your gas, you have your blah, 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 blah. Guess what's not going to get paid first? Your student loan. Because anything else you don't pay, you're going to lose and you need all of those things. It's not like you have extra money, you're going to go shopping, but you're always going to pay for your house, your car, your electricity, your food, you know, and there's extenuating circumstances. I mean, do I think they should wipe it off for everybody? I don't because people are lazy. They are just flat out lazy. We have people over here taking handouts from the government right now and they don't want to go back to work. So they're taking advantage of the pandemic and the free money. And they say, hey, I got a Joe Biden. We got our stimulus check. I'm going to go buy car parts or I'm going to go buy a new gun. It's like it's not for that. If you don't need it and you can't give it back because you have to claim it on taxes, put it up somewhere. Invest it. Have your money work for you. And I'm not a great investor, but I just at my age now, 45, I kind of understand a lot more. So that's that's kind of where I fall on. I'm, I'm for it, but we need to figure out what it really entails, you know, and I don't think it should be education should be free moving forward. It just doesn't work in our system here. It just does not work. People appreciate things more when they have to work for them. Totally agree. Yeah, because myself, I have not actually gone to the university, so I have not experienced any kinds of uh, education loans that I have to apply for. But I do hear you, and uh, I guess uh, it is definitely something that is worth looking into much in depth because it is, from what you have described, a prevalent uh, issue in the US. But uh, now that you mentioned the various other kinds of um, commitments that is, uh, I guess, on the shoulders of young Americans, such as, you know, mortgage and car and stuff like that. I mean, how, how do a normal person, uh, it, you know, from what you have experienced, how do they balance it out? I mean, how, how is, is the jobs paying the salaries that's enough uh, to take care of all these things? Um, I mean, with the COVID situation, has it even been changed further? I mean, what do you know on your side that you can share? Well, it's a very imperfect system and I don't want to blame the system because people are still responsible, but we have a big problem with not only do we have unemployment, but we have underemployed. And so underemployed is you, you find a job because you need a job. You're overqualified because of your education. And so no one is too good, in my opinion, to do something like if I want to go be a janitor, I can be a janitor, but it's not going to pay for my college. And even if I didn't have student loans, it's not going to pay for my apartment or my groceries. And if I have a family, you know, and so if you raise the pay for everybody, then it's, it's just a sliding scale. Right. I mean, it, it doesn't really fix the problem. So what fixes the problem is, I think, and this is oversimplifying the situation is there needs to be more available jobs. There's, it's, it's hard to tell an employer to, hey, hire me or hire two people half my age for half as much money, but that's twice the production as me, right? And so I think it all comes down to, it really trickles down to, there's not a lot of skilled trades anymore. We don't focus on that like we should. Back in the 70s and the 80s, it's all about become a truck driver, learn how to roof, learn how to fix something. Um, we don't do that anymore. And I think that our education system is a little messed up here because it, it doesn't, no one from the top says this is what the 50 states have to do. They say these are the two tests you have to pass and every 50 state figure it out. And then within those 50 states, they say, okay, well, each city has your own school district. You guys figure it out. And so what happens is you have some really good schools and a lot of school money and you have some really poor schools with no funding. And that, to me, is the root cause of the issue. So then to bring it back full circle to your question, you know, how are these people paying for these things today? Let's just take COVID, um, the pandemic, and let's just set it aside because it's not like we had our issues. We didn't have any issues till 
December 31st of 2019, right? Yeah, I mean, the issues have been here for decades. And anything from the labor unions where people get paid way too much, like let's say, let's go back to me saying I was a janitor. If I'm a janitor working for a labor union for the Ford Motor Company in Detroit, and I've been there 20 years, I'm probably making $80,000 a year as a janitor, right? And that is way off balance, way off balance. And so if you're part of a labor union, you're going to be making more money than if you're not in a labor union. And so that's kind of the kind of kind of the imbalance. So for people who aren't in that, they have a car note. And a lot of people aren't even buying cars anymore. Young people, they just do ride share. But, you know, if you have a car note, you're not, you're not moving out as fast as you used to. You're still living at home with mom and dad because you can't afford to move out. Or you're working two, sometimes three jobs. Or check this out. Because there's people who do this too. Say I'm giving government, I'm getting assistance from the government. I'm, I'm poverty, so I'm not making a certain amount of money a year. And if I don't make that amount of money, then the government is going to give me money. So if I keep claiming that, and I have multiple kids, and I'm going to get money for each kid, plus whatever money on top the government's giving me because I'm not making a lot of money. I have a job, but if I get if I make two dollars an hour more. I lose all of that. So where's my motivation to do better, right? So I'm, I'm giving up free money. And so we have millions of people that have that mindset and they're living off the government because of that. So that creates that huge imbalance, honestly. So the people who, people are able to do it, not everybody's struggling, but there is a lot of people struggling. And the thing is, you don't know when you're looking at somebody. We have a lot of people who like to act like they have a lot. But they may go. They may be going to the food banks every Friday, getting free food because honestly, they just don't have the money for food. They just look like they do because they want to buy the expensive things, you know. And that's another part of our culture that's kind of messed up. It's all about, and not everybody, but I got the new shoes. I'm going to pay fifteen hundred dollars for a pair of special Jordans, but I can't afford to pay my phone bill. You know, some sometimes people's priorities are all screwed up, and so that's why I said you can't just blame the system. You can't just blame the government because there's systems within systems within systems. And I would imagine every country has this on some level. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, Jay, because um, when you talked about the guy who is going to be putting money aside to buy the new Jordans versus paying for something that's more important, um, you know, and, and yet he's actually in a situation where he's not well off. So that mm -hmm. actually brings me to mind, it's short, short of memory where somebody was telling me when I was in Hong Kong and I was looking at all the um, state of the people who are really not well off, they're really in, in impoverished conditions, right? Um, there's, a, there's a good, as we all know, there's a, there's a big divide between the wealthy in Hong Kong and, and the mm -hmm. poor. So the guy was basically telling me, because I am not in the situation uh, neither am I super rich, right? So I'm just like in the middle. And yeah. he's telling me that, you know, I've never experienced what it's like to be really poor. Meaning that you don't know where you're staying tonight or you don't know what's coming at the end of the month, you know. So these are the people who, from what I've experienced, are in such a situation. And yet I can't understand how this other person in the States will actually go and get the new Jordans because over in Hong Kong, if the person is in that state and he and he gets the money for the Jordans, he's not gonna buy the Jordans. So what what is the what do you think is the is the difference here? Mindset, you know, culture? Yeah. You know? It's it's the culture, it's the mindset. And I love my country, but but I've I've said, you know, some of the best things with this country are also the worst things, you know, and and there's nothing I can do about it because it also starts. And I got in this big, we got in a big discussion here in our, in our household a couple of weekends ago. My wife and I were kind of on two different sides of this. Hmm. And I said, a lot of it starts in the home. You know, uh, the, the values. Because her thing was, well, when I go to school, I need to be taught how to do this stuff. I said, yeah, you can be at school, but it doesn't matter if you're not getting the support at home. If whether you have a one parent or both parents or your grandparents, they're not instilling the value of the dollar and what survival is. And I think some people who come from nothing 
can manage it better once they get something, and sometimes they they're worse. You know, and so with the case of the Jordans, as an example, I think that it's just it's perspective, life experiences. You know, maybe they don't, maybe maybe like with our government, they haven't been at that point of where they're complete rock bottom because they know that okay, well, I shouldn't really be buying this, but my sister has me or my mom's going to take care of me or I'm going to get that check on the 15th from the government. So I might as well go ahead and buy these Jordans now because I'm in love with them. So I think a lot of his mindset. Yeah. I think you make a very good point when you talk about it a lot starts from the family. So one of the things I've learned actually from some of my peers is that when they have children, they don't, don't just hand out money to that kid. They actually make them do a work when they're young and then actually teach them the value of what is money, right? If, if uh, the parents are able to, to actually teach the children because they have probably gone through it themselves. I would think that, uh, again, I'm, I'm not saying that this is the rule. I'm just saying based sure. on the stereotyping that maybe the rich dad would just give the, the son the keys to a new Porsche versus having him work for it, right? So, and we, and we I think we do see that uh, quite a lot in, even in Singapore, in Asia, in, in China, where, you know, in China, you know, there's lots of rich people and uh, most of them are actually in the States, right? Mm -hmm. And in the crazy rich Asian uh, movies and how mm -hmm. these kids in school are driving fan fanciful cars, but even better than yours, oh. maybe. Yeah, I think we can all agree that the whole basis of it is education, and education is, it starts with a family, right? Because you go to school only this amount of hours every day, but you are in the family unit, the family household uh, for more hours, right? And I guess it's, it might not be as prevalent in the States because I guess uh, young people move out and things like that. But over in Asia, you know, the young normally do stay with the parents for a lot longer. That's a, that's a good point because the values come from home. Right. That's where your values, your values either come from the, your family or they come from a mentor that grabs you at a young age. You, you don't go to school. You don't learn values at school. You know, you don't learn values on the job except for maybe how to you know, coexist with coworkers. But your core values come from your environments as you're around all the time, like you're saying. And, and, and going back to the Jordans, that's a values thing, you know. And so when your parents make you work or even chores, like I grew up in a house where I had to do chores. We got an allowance, but we had to work for our, our money. So we got like two bucks a week. Wow. You know, kid, kid, well, relatively speaking. So, yeah. but like kids these days, like when I would, you know, the tooth fairy, I don't know if you guys have tooth fairy, but you know, you lose a tooth and you put the yeah. tooth underneath your pillow and the tooth fairy would give you like a quarter and you're like, hell yeah, I got a quarter. But I have a niece and nephew. They get like 10, 20 bucks and they're not even 10 years old. I'm like, what is this kid going to do with this money? Mm. You know, so it just some of those values and the value of money just is, isn't there. But we're our culture here. We don't have a set culture. It's broken up so much. So, you know, this household is going to be different than the next household. And if we're all living in neighborhood over on the east side, we may have a different mentality than people from the north side. You know, regardless of what your skin color looks like, uh, the people on the north side are, are the more affluent, so they have more of the money. Some of it's new money, some of it's old money. You know, people on the south side don't really have money. Nobody has money. And so, you know, their mindset's going to be different. And that's just this city, you know. So we you know, take that by 50 states and hundreds of cities. You know, we say people on the east coast are rude. People on the west coast don't care about anything. So people in the south are nice and people in the Midwest are upset at everybody so it's just it's just kind of one of, the, one of those weird things is a is a stereotyping in the states oh pff, yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah and i think i think you get that everywhere you know around the world but here it's not like you have your american and then you don't have your american here you have your american and there's so many different ones you know, do you like Ford? Do you like Chevy? Do you like Trump? Do you like Biden? You know, Republican, you're Democrat. And it's just nasty sometimes between the people. A lot of people don't know world history. And I always say this and people look at me crazy, especially my wife. I go, look, the United States is one of the youngest first world countries historically. Historically, I said, if you want to hear about 
racism, genocide, all sorts of things. Just study world history, you know, study the Christianity wars, you know, study this, study the the Chinese and Japanese, you know, you know, study North Korea, South Korea, the, the, the different Vietnams, you know, borders. It's, it's nothing new. Um, but I think that we, we are trying to progress at a faster rate due to modern technology. And then people tell me that's like, well, you're just saying, well, it's, we're doing good. It's good enough. I'm like, that's not what I'm saying. We can always do better, but change is not a light switch. Change takes time, right? Whether it's the family structure, whether it's racial stuff, whether it's systemic this, you know, for us in the 1960s and the 50s, you know, black people and white people couldn't drink from the same water fountain. Here we are, you know, 80 years later or 60 years later, you can't expect it to be, I mean, we, we can't now, right? But our grandparents lived through that. Some of our parents lived through that. Some of us lived through that in a, in a different aspect. And it's going to take, it's a, it's a multi-generational transformation, in my opinion. You can't just force people to think a certain way because people won't all of a sudden decide they don't want to think a certain way. They'll just stop talking about it. But if they're still thinking it, then that first opportunity they get to show it, it's going to come out. And that's kind of what we've been having happen here a lot. Because, you know, the former president, Donald Trump, people either love him or they don't like him. And you have Americans walk around saying, well, he's the reason why people are racist. It's like, are you kidding me? Do you think racism started four years ago? Racism is a problem in world history. You know, stop being ignorant. And I think what happened is people who thought that he was and liked that, I don't know if he is or not. I don't make those judgments. But people who thought that, they're like, hey, he's like, he's like me. You know what? I don't like you, 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 or you, and I don't like that color. Huh. And then the next door neighbor says, you know what? I don't like it either, but I didn't want to say anything because I was just too afraid. But now it's okay. And I think that's kind of what's happened over here in the last 10 years. You know, it's not that people all of a sudden woke up and decided they were one way or the other. People just started feeling more comfortable expressing it. And that's a positive and a negative. The positive is you get to see how people really are. The negative is we teach people since they were four or five years old that you can be anything you want. And while you can be, there's some things you just can't be. And we need to teach them that too. You know, not everybody can get first place. Only one person can get first place. Not everybody can get first place. So if you don't get first place, then if you really want it, then you just have to work harder to get better. And if you don't really want it, then it's not for you. But we don't teach people that. We teach people this last 20, 30 years, you can have everything you want, make them earn your respect. See, elders, it's really big in cultures. If you're my elder, you don't have to earn my respect. I respect the fact that you're my elder. And so I'm going to treat you with respect. I just am because you've been there and I haven't. But we don't really teach that. So what happens is people grow up and they don't have any respect. And that's just part of this whole big problem we've been talking about for the last 30, 40 minutes. Well, on the subject of uh, that you just brought up <clears throat> about, you know, blacks and whites. So you mentioned that you've been often been mistaken for your ethnicity. Could you tell us more about uh, your ethnicity? Sure. So I'm actually 50% Vietnamese and a few other Asians in there and then probably like 40% two different African Americans. But looking the way I look, people see me as being African American, which I understand. When I grow my hair out a little bit, people are kind of confused. And then there's some people who look at me and they know that I'm Asian. They're like, you're mixed, aren't you? Or you're Vietnamese or you're blah, blah, blah. blah. But most people see me and treat me if they're going to treat me any different as if i'm african-american so yeah um on that subject you know i had a, we had a recent uh, situation well a little case in singapore whereby a chinese man was uh, going about just ranting off to an indian man who is with a chinese girl so you just mentioned that racism has been around for for since god knows when right. it's also 
prevalent in in Singapore. It's again, yep. you know, it, I guess it wasn't caught on camera before, and now we have all these mobile phones, and anybody can just take a shot and and basically prove that what has been underlying all these well that we have just been maybe covering with with like papering over, right? So again, with um, in order for us to to actually grow as a people, we're still a very young entire human race, I would say, compared to mm -hmm. Dinosaurs and all these things that scientists have discovered, like the world, has, the, the Earth has been around for millions and millions of years. So, for us to actually be better at what we are, we have to first of all be, I guess, you know, it's, it has to be kind. You have to be kind, right? You have to be uh, tolerant, uh, like you said, respect, and of course, education. And importantly, like you have mentioned, you know, learning about history, which I guess most people. Even myself, I'm not as I'm not a student of history. So you have to actually go about to initiate that curiosity, initiate to learn about history versus it being taught to you because nobody's teaching history. Because there's many parts of history that is, uh, I guess, too uh, embarrassing or too yeah, yeah. obvious to be taught to young people. And that might be a case. Again, so it, it could be a case of people, the educators thinking that they're trying to protect the young from something. But at the same time, you know, it, it's, it's a, between a, hot, a rock and a hot place. Yeah. So, I mean, we have this term that's, that's kind of big now. It's called whitewashing. And what that means is since America is predominantly white American, that they've kind of steered in history, the books and the lessons towards favorable white people. And so you use white, you hear whitewashing a lot. And it's brought a lot of doubt, I think, in a lot of higher education and educators. And I don't know how they're going to fix that because I think that there's in some schools are starting to get rid of like US history and a few of these other things. And I think it's valuable, but it needs to be told through the proper lens and through the truth, right? So, for example, we use Christopher Columbus and we celebrate for us Thanksgiving, which is when he came over um, from Spain and they found the American Indians. The American Indians taught them how to survive and all that kind of stuff. And now we have Columbus Day. But more stuff has come out where it seems like the actual truth. And we know how early man is in, in conquesters, right? They came over and they basically turn the American Indians into slaves once the American Indians showed them how to survive and, and drove them off their land. And he wasn't a nice person. He was a very bad person, which makes sense if he's out to conquest, because that's what everybody did in the 1800s and 1700s and 1600s and early, early man, regardless of where you're from. But instead of teaching that, instead of teaching the errors of our ways, of human ways, it's the good. This is what happened, and everybody was happy, and everyone sat down and had dinner together. I mean, you know, and I know that's just not how history works all the time. Um, so, you know, so there's a little certain part of history that you still have to kind of. You don't always know if it's true or not. You just have to hope that it's in the best of intentions, and then somewhere, this, this is what they always say: there's three sides of every story, right? There's this side, there's this side, and somewhere in the middle, there's the truth, you know? So it's being able to find out whatever that truth is if you're curious enough about it, so. Well, that's a very uh, interesting final point, you know? Indeed, we will always seek the truth. The truth is there for us to, you know, maybe extrapolate, right? Once we've heard mm -hmm. this side and this side, right? Never... You know, I mean, the, the, the way to do, go about it is never to just uh, fall onto one side or to side with one side, but, you know, to use your own, look at the facts that's being presented and then draw your own conclusion and hopefully that conclusion will lead us to the middle. Right, because your conclusion could be one side or the other, but at least you've listened to both sides. And, you know, that's, as you've seen, I mean, you're on social media, you know, you for dealing with all the crap that you deal with um, people on social media, they don't research. They just, if you post something and against whatever, and I, I don't like them all. I'm just going to share your post. I'm not even going to look into it. I'm just going to keep sharing it. And you see that happen all the time. 
and it's it's been really bad lately with some of the stuff that we have going on over here and it's like people if you would just just open your eyes do the research and then decide if it's for you don't just do it because you're helping somebody else out or don't just do it because it's what you think you believe in and you don't even know how it started so yeah somewhere in the middle all right jay uh, so I think we reached our times up. Uh, you know, I, I know you're busy, having a busy day. So is there anything else you want to tell the audience before we sign off? You know what? No, I, I, uh, I really appreciate you having me on. I'm sorry it took so long. Uh, if you guys are interested in hearing more, if you like Acura NSX, you know, you can always follow me on Instagram at NA2NSX. Uh, that was that is that was my it is my car. It just doesn't look like that anymore. And um, if you're interested in the podcast, it's the Hard Parking Podcast, the non-automotive automotive podcast. And this is this is the logo right here. Uh, can you see it? Uh, uh, Not really, but uh, we'll. Yeah, it's it's available anywhere you would normally get your podcast. Right, and then this is actually a model. There it is. Of, uh, yeah. of, uh, Let me get out of the way. Jay's car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, right? Okay. So as usual, we will uh, leave a link in the description below on uh, Jay's uh, podcast and his uh, platform. Uh, do check him out. And uh, with that, this has oh. been another section of... Oh, go ahead. Also, subscribe to me on YouTube. Hard okay, podcast, we'll, put, hard we'll, put, uh, we'll put Jay's uh, YouTube link, <laughs> all the links that pertains to Jay uh, in the description below. Again, do check it out. Uh, on that note, this has been another session of Straight Talk with me, Noel Lee. Until the next session, take care and I'll see you guys. Mm -hmm.